Greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to AMC Mailbag, the all mailbag show here on AMC Movie News, where all we do is take your mailbag questions. My name is John Campion. I'm the editor in chief of AMC Movie News. I'm so glad you're joining us today. And I'm also extra glad that we're being joined by our host today, Miss Ashley Mova. Ashley, how are you doing? I'm great. I had a lot of fun last time, so I couldn't stay away. Had to it come was, back for more. You did really good last week, Thank by the way. You. It was so much fun having you here. It's so <laughs> nice not doing the mailbags by myself. Anyway, guys, as I was saying, on this show, all we do is take your mailbag questions. Now, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like addressed on the show, you can email us anytime at amcmovietalk at gmail.com. Send your questions in 24-7. Maybe you'll see it here on AMC Mailbag. Maybe you'll see a question on Movie Talk. Maybe you won't see it at all, but we'll try our best <laughs> to get to as many as we can. With all of that out of the way, let's get to the first question of the day. So, okay. Ashley, what do we got? Lee Page writes, hey guys, love the show. I know how romantic comedies can typically be hard to watch, but I think we all have our guilty pleasure ones we just can't resist. Minds, you've got mail and Ghosts of Girlfriends Past. How about y'all? It's funny, Ghosts of Girlfriends Past was actually on TV the other day. That's the Matthew McConaughey one, right guys? Did you watch it? I did watch a little bit. Well, it's got Emma Stone in it too. Uh, oh, and like, it was, it was like right in the midst of Matthew McConaughey's you know, shirtless phase, where it's just put put him whatever movie he wants. Just, <laughs> he's speaking in a southern drawl and, and show his show his abs. You know that that's that he was in that stint and and during that time, that was the time when I kept telling everybody, look, ignore the types of movies he's right. doing. Trust me, this is an elite level mm -hmm. actor, and people couldn't see it because of the movies he was in. Um, uh, but I would not have that film anywhere near <laughs> near the top of my list. Uh, a couple come to mind. But it also, it depends on your definition of a romantic comedy, mm -hmm. you know, because on one hand, you could say 40 year old virgin, which I think is like my, my number one or my number two all time favorite comedies. Okay. My two favorite comedies, 40 year old virgin and noises off. Um, and depending on the day you ask me, they switch spots, but I, I'm not quite, I don't think I would qualify 40 year old virgin as a romantic comedy. So these are some of the films for me that come to mind. One is a film that I only saw for the first time, like 10 years ago. And that's Annie Hall. Annie Hall is so funny. And you'd think because it's like, I don't, fact checker Ray, give me a date for, for Annie Hall. How, how long ago did Annie Hall come out? But I think it's, it's like 30 years ago. And, and I still think probably the best Woody Allen film. 1977. 1977. So oh, nearly wow. 40 years ago, 40 years old. It's like the funniest one. And the strange thing is, when you watch it today, mm -hmm. it feels very contemporary. Okay. Like, sure, no one's pulling out an iPhone or anything like that, but <laughs> it is so outrageously funny, very sweet at the same time. I think it's Woody Allen at his best. One of my favorite romantic comedies. Uh, another one is going to be, once again, it depends on your definition of romantic comedy, but I'm going to go with one of the all-time greats, Princess Bride. <laughs> Love it. As you wish. I mean, Princess Bride is is one of the greatest movies ever. And I don't know that love has ever been so, you know, poeticized about in a movie as much as in The Princess Bride. And it's filled with such wonderful characters because it's not just, you know, it's not just Wesley and Buttercup. You know, because you could have a great movie just with Wesley Buttercup. It's just, it's Inigo Montoya. It's, you know, uh, 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 oh, what's, what's the name of the, the character who has him with the Battle of Wits? Uh, Vicini. It's, uh, Honor the Giant. It's like, it's, uh, Miracle Max. It's, you know, everybody. It's the Six Fingered Man. It's Prince, you know, the movie is just so great and romantic and sweet and hilarious. All at the same time, it will never go out of style. Actually, about, Two years ago, Anne and I started once a year. There's always a local theater, at least once a year, that will play Princess Bride in theater in Aww. L.A., and we always go. That's a great so, tradition. Oh, it's so wonderful. So uh, Annie Hall, Princess Bride, a strange one, but I contend this is a romantic comedy, is the Jack Nicholson film As Good As It Gets oh, okay. with Greg Kinnear and... I just, Greg Kinnear, who's so good. I think he might have gotten nominated for an Academy Award for that, for Best Supporting Actor. I'm not absolutely positive about that. But um, one of the funniest lines, because Jack Nicholson plays this totally wrecked person. And he's he's a famous author who writes under a pseudonym, mm -hmm. right? And But he's actually got all these mental issues and problems. And on top of that, he's just a jerk to people. <laughs> and one of the funniest lines um, he runs into the secretary at a publishing company and she goes, Mr. Walters or whatever his name in the movie is, I just got to ask, how do you write women so well? And Jack Nicholson looks at her and says, 
Oh, okay. What exactly he says? He goes, I think of a man and then I remove logic and accountability. And that's, that's how he writes women. That's um, terrible. I, 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 it's, it's awful. But when you know the character, right? When you know the character, it's right. hilarious. So the, as good as it gets. Another one that I will say just barely fits into the romantic comedy thing is Forgetting mm. Sarah Marshall. Ooh, I, okay. that, I love that movie. That movie is just raunchingly hilarious. Um, one of my all-time favorite romantic comedies is the Steve Martin, uh, Daryl Hannah film, uh, Roxanne, which is the Eng- it's it's a rendition of the Cyrano de Bergerac story. So Steve Martin plays the the our version of Cyrano de Bergerac with the long nose and stuff like that, and he's in love with the beautiful woman, and he's articulate and smart, a poet's heart, a warrior, but be- he feels he's ugly because he's got the super long nose, and so he gets a handsome man to recite poetry. And love, you know, you know, phrases to the woman he loves, but he's whispering those phrases to him. So he says them. So he feels that even though the girl's falling in love with the handsome guy, he kind of Aww. feels like I'm winning because really she's falling in love with me. She just doesn't know it. It's, mm. it's so funny. It's so great. I love, I mean, one of Steve Martin's best. Uh, and then the last one I'll mention is my best friend's wedding. Oh, uh, my best friend's one. wedding with Julia Roberts. It is one of the only three or four movies in my life that I have cried at. I I cried at the best of the best, which we talked about the <laughs> right, other day. Again, the best best. Uh, I cried at the end of Life Is Beautiful. Uh, I might have choked up a little bit at the end of Toy Story three when it looked like they were all going to go mm-hmm. down to the fire pit and they held hands, and that's that's just awesome. But the the ending scene, one of the final scenes of my best friend's wedding. I get really moved not by romance. I get moved by friendship and and acts of loyalty. Mm-hmm. And in my best friend's wedding, she basically has to take defeat. You know, the man she's in love with, her best friend, married the other woman. And she's at the wedding and she's trying to be strong for it, but she's hurting. And she gets on the phone with her gay best friend who lives in Chicago or something like that. And as she's talking to him on the phone, she looks up and realizes he flew all the way from Chicago to be there because he knew she would need him. Aww. And I got choked up. And I, I got to admit, I started to have a couple of tears. So I, I, I think romantic comedies get a bad rap, actually. Mm-hmm. I, a well-done romantic comedy is a great time at the movies. Yes, and and so is. so these are just a bunch <laughs> of them that I like. What, what are one or two of your favorite romantic comedies? Um, one that I could easily watch. 10 times in one day would be how to lose a guy in 10 days. I love it. <laughs> speaking I of Matthew McConaughey. Love it. Speaking of Matthew McConaughey. <laughs> can't complain with that. But um, I remember one time we were all, the AMC crew was at Barney's Beanery and you were talking about possible future show ideas. And I said, John, what about a romantic comedy show? And you said that they don't really make romantic comedies that Not often enough. anymore. Yeah. Why is that? I don't know. I, I don't know if like, it felt like in the, especially the late 90s, mid to late mm-hmm. 90s, it's like, I know you thought it felt like there were a lot of romantic comedies, right. and maybe that was the problem. Maybe every they, they, romantic comedy started to get a bad rap. Maybe mm. they felt like they needed to pull back. I'm ready for a resurgence of good romantic comedies. Me too. I think right there with you. Yeah. All right. What's next? Jessica Ma writes. My question is regarding the Avengers if Infinity War movies. Why is Joss Whedon not in talks to direct? I mean, he has delivered the best Marvel movie to date, box office wise, and Avengers: Age of Ultron is looking to be a mind blowing movie. Yet speculation surrounding the film is that the Russo brothers are going to direct the biggest Avenger movie. Not that I have any problem with that. I think they did a great job with Cap Two. It just seemed to me that Joss Whedon is not even considered for speculation to direct. Why is that? Is it a contract issue? If so, why wouldn't Feige throw more money at Whedon to keep him in? There's a lot of different layers to this. Mm -hmm. Um, First of all, let's start with the assumption that Joss Whedon would even want to direct Mm -hmm. another film after this. Another event, yet another one. Joss Whedon has been now immersed in this Marvel Cinematic Universe for years. Mm -hmm. And he might be getting tired of it. I mean, it, it, remember, Joss Whedon is a creative force. He likes to create his own things. Mm-hmm. And he's been tied to this. And I remember I spoke with him the day after they completed everything. Like they put the final edit. Everything was done on Avengers. And I talked to him the next mm-hmm. day. And he looked like he was just in a World Wrestling Federation <laughs> battle royal. I mean, he <laughs> looked beaten and tired and exhausted. He's like, Ugh. like it was just like... This dude's a zombie right now. And you couldn't blame him. Like, he was right. completely exhausted. I wasn't even sure he would come back to direct a second Avengers film. But he did. And that's fine. Mm-hmm. 
But we have to really be open to the possibility that Joss Whedon may now be like, hey, guess what? I put in my time. I made the big blockbusters. Now I got things I've written right. of my own creation that I want to get made. So studios sign up and make the movies that I want to make now. Mm-hmm. And, and so I think he's totally within his rights to do that. I'm not even sure he wants to return. But even if he did want to return... <clears throat> I think, and I said this before when talking about if he would come back for a second one, I don't know that I would want Joss Whedon to come back. Why? He is awesome. But part of the thing is that I find that really creative minds, Mm -hmm. guys like Joss Whedon, guys like Sam Raimi, who are really these creative, visionary types of directors, when you take a a creative force like that and put them in one property Mm -hmm. for too long... Mm -hmm. I find their creativity can get stale. You know, I find they can get frustrated as filmmakers. Their creativity gets stale. And because look what happens to Sam Raimi. Everybody knows what a great director Sam Raimi is. He's one of the best. Spider-Man 1, yay! Spider-Man 2, yay! What happened? He stayed with it. And he stayed. And then we get into the third Spider-Man. It's like, where'd the creativity go? And everybody who doesn't know what the hell they're talking about likes to go, oh, it's because the studio made them put Venom in it. That's not why the movie was bad. Why didn't he just make a good movie with Venom in it? It was, And you hear Sam Raimi talk about it now. He was fatigued. You know, creativity-wise, you get fatigued if you stay on the same thing and aren't allowed to explore being creative in other types mm-hmm. of things. I mean, look at George Lucas for having He went from being the wonder kid of Hollywood to, like, the butt of a joke now. As he, just, he just constantly lived in Star Wars. Even though he didn't make a Star Wars movie for 20 years, he still just mm-hmm. lived in Star Wars. You know, I think, I think if George Lucas had finished Return of the Jedi and then continued to be a filmmaker... Like, was out directing a new mm-hmm. film every three, two to three years, right? If that George Lucas had then come back and directed the Star Wars prequels, mm-hmm. we would have had Star Wars prequels that we weren't ashamed of. Mm-hmm. Uh, but instead, he didn't. And so, when I look at this situation, I think Joss Whedon's awesome. I don't want him to come back for Avengers. Yeah, because okay. I think it's bad for him. Okay. I think if he's coming back doing Avengers, that means we're not seeing his creative work that he could be doing with other projects. And I think we run the risk of his creativity getting dulled and compromised from staying on the same group of characters for yet another film. I just think it's time to go. And also, you know, uh, what was her name? Jessica brought up, you know, the Russo brothers. And that's great. Joss Whedon isn't the only guy in town who's capable of delivering Mm -hmm. a great Marvel film. Mm -hmm. We've seen that with just now with the Russo brothers. I don't know if the Russo brothers are going to end up being the directors or if they're going to get somebody Mm -hmm. else. But I think Joss Whedon, or not Joss Whedon, I think Kevin Feige has proved that he can find great directing talent and match them with the right film to get a great thing out of it. So I don't think it's good for Joss to come back. I think it's not great for the movies for him to come back. And I think Marvel has proven that just because you get one director who did it great doesn't mean that's the only director who can do it great. Mix it up a little bit. Keep it fresh. Your point definitely makes sense, but I know for me, and I think for a lot of people, sometimes you get bummed out when you hear the director's not oh, coming yeah, back. Yeah. So why is that? Why do people really want, I guess you like the film for a reason. Yeah, I mean, I think part of, well, I've always said the director is the most important person on any movie, right? right? And you, especially when they do it right the first time. Mm-hmm. Look, it's so, we talk about this all the time. It is so monumentally hard to make a good movie. Mm-hmm. Everybody just thinks making a good movie is the easiest thing. And if you make a bad movie, it's just because you didn't try. Right. You can get the most gifted, talented, awesome people in the world and still make a bad movie. It's so hard. And so when there's a good movie, mm-hmm. I, the primary person responsible for it, in my opinion, not the only person, right. but is the director. Mm-hmm. And so you feel like, we, I trust him. I want him to come back and direct the next one. But then after we get past two and we get into three mm-hmm. or four, then I, I'm kind of like, okay, let's let's mix it up a bit. Let's keep okay. it fresh and, uh, and see where things go from there. Right. That really makes sense. All right. What's next? Soren Havgard writes, Hello, Sons of AMC. Love your show. I watch it every day. You could call it my daily fix. <laughs> my question is about the change in the Doctor Doom background story that he's no longer the dictator of Latveria. Do you think it will ruin the arrogance of Doctor Doom? And how do you think they can capture the essence of the character that he thinks everyone is beneath him when he's no longer a dictator? Keep bringing on the filthy. When this news first came out yeah. on AMC Movie Talk earlier this week, <laughs> First of all, it was Toby Kebbell, the actor who's playing mm-hmm. Doom. He he came out in an interview and said, okay, so here's some of the differences. Number one, it's not Victor Von Doom anymore. It's it's like Victor Domashev or yeah, something like yeah. that. 
Uh, he's not the dictator of Latveria. He's a an antisocial programmer. <laughs> <So crazy. laughs> and uh, a couple other things he said that were just like caught everybody. I was like, what? wait a minute. He's what? And what I said on the show that day, got a lot of people mad at me, but I'm, I'm going to repeat it here. Yeah. I said, okay, that all looks bad. There's no denying. Here, <laughs> Tebel's, Tebel's statement looks bad. I'm not going to say it doesn't. It absolutely does. But what I'm urging everybody to do is just to take a deep breath and step back for a second and realize everything that Kebble was talking about is not what's important. It's not what's important. And I drew an analogy to Heath Ledger's Joker. You know, when you look at the traditional background of, of uh, the Joker mm -hmm. in the Batman mm -hmm. comics, right? Now, the Batman comics... Through, like comics often do, they offer several different variations mm -hmm. of the Joker's origin. Sometimes the Joker says, I don't even really know what my origin is. So, but there have been several Batman stories that show a Joker mm -hmm. origin. And even amongst all the different ones, one of the consistent lines of logic, has, or not logic, of narrative has been that the Joker was, was a mobster at one time. Mm -hmm. He was a member of the mob. That at some point he became the villain known as the Red Hood. And that either directly by Batman, depending on the iteration, or indirectly by Batman, he ends up in a vat full of chemicals that alters him. And mm -hmm. and there's there's one story that talks about how the Joker's family was actually brutally murdered by other people in the mob, which just pushed him over the edge and snapped mm -hmm. him and all that kind of stuff. And Okay. so And that's the, the Joker rendition we saw in Tim Burton's Batman with Michael Keaton and Jack Nicholson, right? That was Jack Nicholson's Batman, or Joker. So I said... Remember, that's the background of the Joker, the traditionally understood background of the Joker, even though, uh, you know, there are different variations, mm -hmm. sure, but that's the traditional understanding of his background. Right. Well, Heath Ledger's Joker completely threw all that out the window. And if you had said to Batman fans a month before, you know, the, Bat uh, the Dark Knight came out, that, oh, by the way, this Joker wasn't previously a, uh, a gangster, was never the Red Hood, and was not thrown into Nevada chemicals by Batman to become what he is. It's it's identical to the situation we have now with Telbu Cable saying, yeah, not the leader of Latveria, uh, anti-social programmer, blah, blah, blah. But what Heath Ledger taught us was that that wasn't important. What was important was once he was the Joker, did he capture the essence of what we wanted the mm -hmm. Joker to be? And it was unique from the comics, yes, but at the same time capturing the essence of what we hoped he would be. So while I do not like what Toby Kebbell has said, and I don't like this kind of setup, let's take a deep breath and say, let's wait till we see Toby Kebbell not as the programmer who's antisocial. Let's wait to see Toby Kebbell as Doom. And does he capture it and nail it as Doom? Because if he does, we're all going to forget about the fact that he's now Victor Domashev right. and that he's a programmer or whatever. Now... If the question is asking, if he's not the leader of Latveria, how can he look down on people? Mm. Look, I know a lot of people, and you know a lot of people, and you know a lot of people who completely look down on other people, and they're not the dictators of their own countries. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I know a lot of programmers. <laughs> programmers can be pretty snooty, but then again, so, so can film critics, <laughs> so can actors, so can plumbers, so can anybody. So I think the essence of, I don't think you have to be the leader of a despotic nation as a prerequisite to have a bad attitude and think you're better than everybody else. They do have to get that in Doom, that he thinks he's better than everybody else. Mm -hmm. If they just have him as an insecure little yeah. guy, that won't work. But if he's antisocial because he's smug and he thinks he's better than everybody else as he's doing his programming or whatever, then you're on the right track. Look, I, this could be a disaster. <laughs> this could be, I'm trying to stay optimistic. This could be an unmitigated disaster. All I'm, or I'm not saying, hey, everybody, don't worry. It's going to be awesome. I'm simply saying, before we overreact, let's just take a deep breath and really analyze it. What What is really happening here? And let's not jump off the boat just yet, but it could be awful. I'm right. worried. I mean, with his career, it's almost like they're kind of going over the top to make it this modern thing to be up to date because we live in this world of technology and anti-social yeah. programmer. So why, why the hell are they doing this? Like, what is the point of changing all these different things? Well, I think one of the reasons they're changing, and John Schnepp and I were talking about this, and he raised a great point, is that, like... Number one, when the Fantastic Four was first created, we're talking, that was the 60s. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a different right. world and storytelling was done differently right. there. In the 60s, you could have the evil man with the long mustache who twirled his mustache <laughs> and went, -ha 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 -ha. <laughs> and that worked then, right? That doesn't work now. The despotic leader of Latveria. Yeah. Okay, that's a little silly. Could they make it work? Yes, they could have made it work. But what I see 
Fox trying to do with Fantastic Four is, look, they try to stay somewhat traditional, Mm -hmm. modestly, with the last two Fantastic Four Mm -hmm. films, and they saw that didn't work at all. I see them trying to bring into a modern context with a modern set of rules of narrative storytelling. And does that break away from the traditional understanding of Fantastic Four? Yes, it does. But that's not necessary. It could be a bad thing, but it's not necessarily a bad thing yet. So I, you know what? I still remain optimistic about the film. Yes, just like everybody else, I'm concerned about a couple things I'm seeing and hearing. But overall, I'm still optimistic and I don't know. Maybe the first trailer will suck. I don't know. But we'll, we'll have to we'll wait and see. see. Yeah, we'll see. All right. What's next? Connor Bargloff writes, Hey, AMC movie crew. I try to never miss a show. My question is about The Hobbit, The Battle of the Five Armies. Do you think that this movie will make a lot more money than usual if the rumored Batman heavy trailer for Batman vs. Superman Dawn of Justice is featured during The Hobbit, The Battle of the Five Armies? Uh, No. Nope. I don't think it's going to make any difference whatsoever because times have changed. And we've talked about this a couple times, actually. You know, it was not that long ago that we would wait to find out what movie a brand new trailer was going to open with. Mm -hmm. And then it it all really started with The Phantom Menace. The Phantom Menace, the, the first of the new Star Wars movies, got everybody so excited that Literally, when it came, when it was announced which movie the trailer for The Phantom Menace, the first new Star Wars film was going to be playing in front of, midnight screenings of those movies sold out. And then when the trailer was done, people walked out. That's crazy. It was insane. And then for a long time, well, maybe we didn't have people just buying tickets just to see trailers. Mm -hmm. We had people saying, maybe I wouldn't have gone to see that movie, but I'm going to go to that one now Mm -hmm. because I want to see the new trailer for the first Transformers movie. I want to see the trailer for this or see the trailer for that. But... The thing is, we're living a different era now, even yeah. just a few years later, that they can say, first of all, we don't know that they're going to be playing a Batman versus Superman trailer in front of The Hobbit because it's still too far away. It'll still be like over a year mm-hmm. and a half away. But even if they did, I don't think one extra person is going to go see it because they know that even before that trailer plays in front of The Hobbit, they're going to release it online the day before. Yeah, right. That's been the pattern lately that... Okay, when they say the trailer is going to be attached to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, okay, but what that really then means is you can expect that about 24 hours earlier than that, it'll hit online for Mm -hmm. the first time. So people know now that they don't have to, if they want want to see their trailer and see it soon, they're going to get to do it from home on their phones, on their tablets, on their computers before it ever hits the screen in a movie. So no, I I don't think this is going to affect the box office, even if it's true. And I don't believe it is. But even if a Batman vs. Superman trailer is playing with The Hobbit, it's not going to make one lick of difference, I don't think, in my opinion. Right. What I've always been so curious because when you go see a movie, it's like the trailers beforehand are kind of in that genre of film. Yeah. So what factors go into deciding which trailer is going to be shown in front of what film? Right. Well, you're showing a trailer as a commercial, right? So mm-hmm. you want to make sure you pu- you're putting that commercial in front of the people that could potentially be your customers, right? right? So when you're doing uh, a football broadcast on television, you'll want to have a beer commercial and you want to have a sports bar commercial right. and you want to have, a, you know, a sneaker commercial because, you know, hope the athletic guys are watching. Yeah. They're going to be feeling athletic <laughs> and I'm going to buy your shoes and I'm going to get in shape. Um, so you want to target your audience. So if you're having like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, mm. you expect we're probably going to have a lot of young people there, probably, probably a lot of kids. Let's show off our upcoming Nickelodeon animated film. Let's show off this Who thing. decides that? It's probably the marketing departments of the studios okay. uh, off, off the top of my head, unless you guys have any other theories about that. But I think it's pretty much up to the to worldwide marketing okay. reps uh, of to which movies. So, for instance, if you had a new Hannibal Lecter movie mm-hmm. coming out, you're not going to put a trailer for the Smurfs yeah. in front of it. It's <laughs> That would be interesting. Or vice versa. If you had a new Smurfs <laughs> movie, you're not going to have the latest movie <laughs> from uh, Rob Zombie coming out. <laughs> Cannibal Holocaust 15. You Great know. title. Extra Flesh <laughs> is the name of the movie. And you have these little seven-year-old kids. Ah! You know, that'd be awesome. But yeah, so anyway. (laughs) All right. Marcos Lopez writes, as many others, I am happy that we'll be getting another Toy Story film soon. But this got me thinking the possible cameos that could appear. Toys of Iron Man, Hulk, or even Batman in the background. Is this possible? Thanks and bring on the filthy. Uh, First of all, I wasn't on AMC Movie Talk the day that the news dropped Mm -hmm. that Toy Story 4 is coming. Right. So, (laughs) so happy. So yeah. very, very so happy. happy. Uh, on, on an argument can be made. We talked about this before. An argument can be made. The Toy Story trilogy, 
-hmm. one of the greatest trilogies of all time. Mm -hmm. Each and every film is a masterpiece. It's incredible. I cannot wait for Toy Story 4. So we're asking, is it possible that we could see things like Hulk, Iron Man, Batman, stuff like that in these? Well, it's possible because, you know, Toy Story is a Pixar film. Pixar Mm -hmm. is owned by Disney. Iron Man, Thor, Hulk, they're Marvel, also owned by Disney. Mm -hmm. So it's possible. You won't see Batman in there. Um, It's possible. But I think it's extremely unlikely. And the reason I believe it's extremely unlikely is because all the toys in Toy Story are basically classic toys. You got the cowboy. You got the spaceman. I mean, you got... A Barbie, which is a sixty-year-old franchise. You got a, you know, a, a, what was it called? A slinky. You had a slinky. Mm-hmm. You had, you know, the. You had a piggy bank. You had Mr. Potato Head. You had all these toys that were considered timeless classics. Mm-hmm. Now let's take a movie like Lego Movie, right. which is awesome, mm-hmm. and I love it. Lego Movie doesn't so much rely on the classics. Although you can say Lego is a classic, right. yes, but Lego Movie uses a lot more pop cultural references, mm-hmm. modern pop cultural references for its humor. And that's its tool and that works and it's great. But it's not what Toy Story has ever done. Right. Toy Story has never been about let's incorporate the big current modern pop culture references. And especially since John Lasseter is coming back to direct mm-hmm. it himself, I don't think we're suddenly going to break with that tradition and now suddenly have an Iron Man toy in there and a Hulk toy. Right. I think they're going to stay away from it. So is it possible? Possible. But I would be surprised if they did. If you had to choose, what toy would you choose? Out of the existing ones or a, a, or a new one to put in? A new one to put in. Oh, a new toy to put in? Yeah. Um, a new toy to put into Toy Story. I don't oh know. They had a Cabbage Patch doll. Well, they oh, had they something that looked like a Cabbage Patch doll. But it, you, know, you know what? It wasn't. I was thinking of the, the basically the zombie one where the one eye is missing or whatever. <laughs> but I guess it's not a couch. Patch. I think a couch patch kid would fit oh, in there okay. nicely. Yeah, it's like a, really now true. 25, 30 years mm-hmm. old, right? Yeah. So maybe that could fit in there well. I like it. What would be your, what was your favorite childhood toy? Oh, I, I was torn because I had a brother. So on one hand, I was like loving Legos and I sucked at Lego building for whatever reason. But of course, Barbies. And my brother would take my Barbies and bungee jump them off the balcony. It's terrible. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> I, I'm going to tell you a story. True story. Um, back in college, and this guy is still a friend of mine on Facebook. Back in college, uh, there were three of us who were friends, and one of us had a teddy bear. I'm in not, college? Yep, in college. He brought it. Wow. And, yep, <laughs> he brought it. And I think it's something his mom gave him. So it's, 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 this is not like an effeminate guy. This is this was a guy's guy. Totally normal in every single way. And he loved his mom. And his mom gave him that. So to him, it's not like he snuggled with his teddy bear. Not like that. But he had it because it was special to him. You know? And so he had it there. And I remember one night, um, he, we there had been some practical joking going on in the dorm. He left. So me and my other buddy, we took a bunch of shoestring and made a giant noose and we hung his teddy bear with the note attached to him. Goodbye, cruel world. That's terrible. <laughs> and he came, we went into our friend's dorm beside our room and we waited for our friend to come back. He came back and you could hear him through the wall. Who did this? So mad. So anyway. You know, he's smart because he's a ladies man. He brought that. So girls could be like, oh my gosh, how cute is this teddy bear? There was more to that teddy bear than you guys figured out. Ladies liked him. Yeah. Uh, see? <laughs> he was dumb, but not so dumb. All right, what's next? <laughs> Joe Vang writes, After rewatching The Conjuring, I realized that the Annabelle doll has nothing to do with the main story of the film. I mean, she had absolutely nothing to do with the family. Do you guys think that it was just a setup for this 2014 spinoff? No, I, I honestly, I don't know that Annabelle was put in there with an eye to giving it its own spinoff mm-hmm. film at first. I think sometimes in good movies, you put other things to flesh out the environment, yeah. right? And I think Annabelle was there really to set up this couple and what it is they do. Mm-hmm. Instead of just diving right into what is the main point and main narrative of this movie, first they gave us, us context for this couple. And so this is so what Annabelle did in the beginning of The Conjuring is set up who this couple is and what it is they yeah. do so that when they get into the main point of it and they go to that family's house, mm-hmm. we know why they're going. Right. We fully understand what's going on. So I have a feeling, I haven't talked to the filmmakers. I could be totally wrong about this. I always had the feeling that 
they just sat back and watched the movie afterwards and said, wow, Annabelle was right. awesome in this. Uh-huh. We got to give her her own movie. As opposed to that was always the plan. I think the plan was just put her in there as a device yeah. to broaden and flesh out the world that they lived in. Right. You actually, thank you for this, by the way, sent me to the Annabelle junket. And I'm such a James Wan fan. So I was fangirling super hard. But on the inside, I was freaking out. But on the outside, I was keeping it cool. Hmm. Uh, I asked him if, if he had planned an Annabelle spinoff. And he said, no, he just makes, when he makes movies, he likes to make them for that movie for that purpose. But John Leonetti, who was the director, said, and he was the director of cinematography, I think, on Conjuring. Right. Um, the director of Annabelle said, yeah, it was in his mind the whole time. It was but, his mind as a director of photography. Yeah, <laughs> but he, his only previous directing credit was Mortal Kombat, um, Annihilation. And Oh, that's turned, not the good like, one. I thought I was getting no, all excited no, no, for a second. No, no, no. I was like, wait a minute. So how does he, go, like a director, like, how did he go from zero to 100 like that? Well, I mean, all, it, it depends on, like you said, he was the director of photography. He was the DP yeah, for yeah. James Wan. And that's about as close to being a director mm-hmm. as as you can be. So if uh and we just saw hey what's the name of the guy um Christopher Nolan's DP who just Wally Fister, Wally Fister who did the Transcendence. Transcendence with Johnny Depp. Wally Fister was J- uh, uh Christopher Nolan's DP for a long time and so there were a lot of high hopes when he was doing this film Transcendence because hey he was under he studied basically under mm-hmm. Christopher Nolan yeah. didn't work out so well but it's a good place for a director to start as a dp because they understand mm-hmm. the the whole concept of of what it goes into making the film and how to structure the film and all and hopefully they've worked with good filmmakers like he worked with James Wan yeah. and so yeah and so when when a guy like James Wan is like okay I'm not going to direct the next one I'll produce it mm-hmm. who's he going to trust right my dp let's put him in the director's chair makes sense. and so it kind of makes sense yep sure all right what's next Christian Dutin writes, first of all, because of you guys, I watched Gone Girl and it was amazing. Mm. However, by the end of the movie, I felt really creeped out by the whole story and the nature of the lead characters. And I'm not sure if I want to watch it again, at least anytime soon. (laughs) The last time I felt this way was when I watched Sweeney Todd. It was a great movie, but I don't think I'll ever watch it again because it was so depressing. I was wondering if you guys watched a movie that was really great, but wouldn't see again. Thanks and bring on the filthy. Yeah, three. Three, three, I know there's more than three, but three immediately come to mind that are just awesome, but they, they affect me so deeply. I don't think I can watch them again. One is, I, I believe Don Cheadle's best performance he's ever given us in Hotel Rwanda. That movie's so disturbing. I mean, it's so brilliant Mm -hmm. at the same time as a character study as well, but that whole scenario, and especially when you know this is a true story, mm-hmm. and this is what really happens in some parts of the world, it it devastates you. Mm-hmm. You know, it it's almost like a rot that develops in your soul. It's mm-hmm. like, oh, that was awesome, and I can't watch it again. You know, sort of thing. And Ho- Hotel Rwanda is one of those films for brilliant, breathtaking Don Cheadle. Mm-hmm. It's what really put him on the map for me as one of just my favorite actors mm-hmm. to see around. Uh, by the way, if you haven't seen Don Cheadle's New TV show, new. It's in its third or fourth season now called House of Lies. Check it out. It's actually really funny. It's really good. Um, the other one is Schindler's List. Uh, brilliant, breathtaking on every level. One of Steven Spielberg's, one of Steven Spielberg's many, many masterpieces. It's incredible. But my soul can't take it. I, I just, I've never been able to watch it again. I've seen it once. I can never, I don't think I can ever watch it again. Another one for me is an older one, and I didn't watch it till years after it was in theater, and I haven't been able to watch it again since, and that is Meryl Streep's Sophie's Choice. Um, you got, okay, <laughs> you got to watch Sophie's Choice, and then never watch it again. Burn it immediately, but I mean, you got to watch it, and tell me you're not a wreck after that movie. Like, tell me you're not a wreck after the movie. I'm totally, totally wrecked. It. As, as much as she is a goddess in the film, that might go down as her quintessential performance as well. It's just, <sighs> anyway, what, what about you? Do you have any movies that you, th- like, you, you saw and you really love? You're like, I can't watch that again. No, because, um, to me, I, I, isn't that what makes a movie good or movie good art? Because it moves you so much to the point of you, you feel so moved by it. Isn't that, wouldn't that, you, wouldn't you consider that good art? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Sense? But I mean, but watch it, it moved me. It just moved me in ways that was like devastating to me. And it's so powerful. It's amazing. It's mm-hmm. awesome. But I, I don't want to be moved that way again watching it because it, it just sense. hurts. You know what I mean? Makes sense. Uh, it, they're rare, those types of films, but those, that would be one for me. 
All right. All right. Uh, this is the last one of the day, huh? Um. Yes. All sir. right. Jason Parrish writes, given the grittier nature of the coming DC films, would you rather have the new universe R-rated? I know it's not at all likely to happen, and I know it would be a bit more exclusive to the younger fans, but I think it would benefit having more freedom that the higher ratings brings. Completely disagree. And, you know, I look, I'm not afraid to be the guy the un with the unpopular opinion because it's right. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, this is just my opinion. But... This whole notion that I, I just don't like bandwagonism, you know, I, I don't like mob mentality bandwagons. And it just seems like there's this huge bandwagon mentality of R is better. If you make it R, it'll be better. <laughs> R makes it right. R is like putting salt on a steak. It just makes everything better and brings out the flavor. Yeah. And I reject that. I do. I think there are some movies that are made to be R. Mm -hmm. And I think there are movies that don't need to be R. It's just that simple. R does not make anything better. R does not make anything worse. You know, and with today's, in today's, you know, culture and society and the nature of the MPAA, you can get away with a lot, especially in the terms of action and violence. There's a lot you can get away with mm -hmm. uh, and have a PG-13 rating. Um, and this whole notion that it needs to be R. But also, if you're one of these people who likes consistency between, you know, your Marvel and DC comic books and your movies, um, the, the comic books are PG-13. Mm -hmm. If, if you like the comic book, why would you want to change it into an R? Yeah. I, I don't get it. Now, I'm, I'm cool with changing things. You've heard me say this a million times. Totally cool with adapting and changing things from comic to the big screen. But just forcing it into an R box, like to take something that doesn't belong in an R box, say, we're gonna, it doesn't matter. We're just going to squeeze it and push it and crunch it so it fits into this R box. So we can say, it's R. Now it'll be awesome. I've never understood that mentality. Like dropping an F-bomb turns a bad movie into a good mm -hmm. movie? No, it doesn't. Show me a great action scene where the ninja, you know, punches his hand through the chest of a guy. <laughs> when he pulls his hand out, whether you just hear or whether you see yeah. blood splatter, is that the difference between the movie being good and not being good? I, I've just never understood the mentality that it's got to be R. Like mm -hmm. I said, I'm all for, for good R-rated stuff. I think there's some stuff that was made to be R and stuff that's not. I don't think comic book movies, other than maybe... Punisher, other than maybe um, a Spawn, that, that they don't need to be R. And just making them R for the sake of being R, mm -hmm. I think is undermining the material. And I think it cuts out a big chunk of the people who can go see your movie. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't think, it, personally, I don't think it makes any sense. Is there a correlation between... Um a movie's rating and box office because let's say if they made a movie rated R and younger kids wanted to go see it and they're like mommy go take me to this movie the mom would have to take the kid to go see the movie and there's two tickets versus one would that be a smart move or would that actually remove audience members well I mean traditionally and we've seen this start to change mm -hmm. traditionally studios would shy away from a, there was a long period of time when studios would generally shy away a bit from R-rated comedies because you know it would hurt the box office yeah. they couldn't get the, the all the audience in that they wanted to get in but with the advent of, of films like super bad mm -hmm. of um uh 21 jump street of comedies like that now they're seeing oh you can make our Great you know, movies. raunchy <laughs> comedies and make them great and make a lot of money. Ted uh -huh. is great. You can you can make these now. So the, so the society shifted a bit. So they see we can do that. And that's great for comedy. Does that extend into comic book genres mm -hmm. for the right comic book? Yes. But I'll be frank. Don't want an R-rated Batman movie. I don't want an R-rated... Yeah. Uh, Bishop movie. I don't want an R-rated Superman movie. I, I, I like them. Give me good, intense, high action in the PG-13 realm and that's where it belongs. That's where it fits and that's where it thrives. Yeah. So I, I don't see it going to R. I feel you. All right, folks. Well, that will do it for us for this installment of AMC Mailbag. Thanks for joining us. And don't forget, just because this episode is over, that doesn't mean it's you can't send in your questions. Send in your questions 24-7 to at amcmovietalk at gmail.com. Also, don't forget, 
Lots of great movies playing in AMC theaters everywhere right now. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for your theater, showtime, and of course, your movie ticket information. If you want an audio-only version of this episode, look in the description of this video, and you'll find a link to our podcast feed so you can listen to us wherever you go. I want to thank my lovely co-host today, Miss Ashley Mova. Ashley, where can people find you online? Uh, Twitter, Instagram, at Ashley Mova. Bye, guys. And you can find me on all the various social media networks just at John Campy. I want to thank the tech crew in here, Fact Checker Ray, we got Ooh. Dennis, we got Jonathan all in here, and thank you guys for joining us. So my name is John Campia for AMC Movie News, and until next time, bye-bye.